This meeting is being recorded. Okay. All right. Everybody, can everybody see the screen? Okay. We're, we've got, okay. Thank you for joining our webinar and Chuck, go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Um, it's nice to be here, everybody. My name is Chuck Rhodes and I work for the US Forest Service and I'm here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I'm going to uh, present the results of a recent study and, and then um, provide a little context for, for what those findings might mean. Um, Gloria's gonna advance slides for me, so it'll be a little clunky, but hopefully you can bear with us. Go ahead, Gloria. So, uh, Lodgepole pine, which is what I'm going to talk about, is kind of a stoic species. Um, it seems to really uh, thrive on disturbance, um, and 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 it does better than um, does better than a lot of species from a variety of um, disturbances. Some folks might say it actually does too well, um, and that there's maybe too much lodgepole out on on the landscape in some places. Um, the, um, it's interesting if you look at an old quote like this um, from, from one of the very first Journal of Forestry um, um, proceedings, even at that point, they were acknowledging the high variability in post-fire disturbance or in post-disturbance um, densities and sort of the, some of the thoughts about maybe what's going on with that. Go ahead, Gloria. So um, in Colorado, um, in the last couple decades, Lodgepole pine has been having sort of a rough go of things. Um, we had a significant bark beetle outbreak um, in the aughts um, that affected a large amount of the state. You can see uh, the, the map on the left-hand side and a, and a picture of some um, severely um, se severe beetle kill in the Williams Fork area. Um, that, that affected large chunks of the, of the lodgepole pine um, distribution in the state. And then, and then in 2020s during the COVID year, so we started to have these fairly large uh, um, wildfires in those same stands. So we're now, you now hear people talking a lot about this kind of compound disturbance. And in Colorado, our, our favorite compound disturbance is bark beetles followed by fire. Um, given the projections of increased fire, um, in the future, more of these kinds of compound disturbances are likely. And that's kind of important because we really don't know that much about how multiple disturbances fit together. So, um, so that's a kind of an important point. Lodgepole pine in Colorado is at the southern edge of its distribution. And so even in the, in the absence of disturbance, um, it's already facing some stresses uh, having to do with climate change. So climate envelope work and climate vulnerability works suggest that it's at a, at a moderate to low um, 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 sensitivity to climate change just without disturbance. Okay, go ahead, please. So, so I'm, a, I'm a watershed researcher and, and one might ask, and I might ask myself, why do I care about all of this stuff? Well, these forests that we're talking about are the sources of of water to most of the West. So 75% of our, of our water is coming from headwater forests and the conditions in those forests are very, are, are very linked to the downstream water quality. So we all know post-fire water quality is affected by erosion, by the distribution of ash, um, and that has downstream and sometimes long-term effects. And we also know from, for, from a lot of research in various places that the, the rate of recovery of those watersheds is very uh, dependent on revegetation. So what's happening to lodgepole pine following fires is going to be very relevant to downstream um, sub water supply for agricultural, industrial, and residential uses. Okay, Gloria. So a few years, so, so one of the things that, that most people learn about lodgepole pine, I remember learning this as a sophomore or a freshman in college, is that it has this cool thing called serotony. And serotony is kind of this classic example of, of, of resilience to disturbance. So cones uh, contain seed that are sealed within the cones and then released after a fire. And so you, the canopy seed bank uh, is, 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 is set up to, to regenerate uh, and, and distribute a lot of seeds. And you can see a lot of the work that we have, a lot of the information we know about lodgepole pine comes from some great work in the Yellowstone uh, 
um, ecosystem. And, and the figure on the left points out that even if you have a fairly low level of, of serotony in a stand, you can regenerate um, stands and, and have fairly good stocking. So even if 10% of the trees have serotony, you, you would have what would count as a stock stand. And above that, things go up quite a bit higher. So um, you know if you've got over 50%, you might have um, hundreds of thousands of stems per hectare, or close to 100,000 per acre. Well, we started looking into this a little bit and Dan Tinker, who was involved in some of that Yellowstone work has helped establish some studies along the Colorado Wyoming border. And we started to notice some things that were a little bit different from that. So we find that that serotony in, in, in a number of stands until we get up to a serotony level of above 50%, we really have very little regeneration at all. So forget about 10%. At 10% serotony in stands that we were looking at, we had virtually no regeneration. It wasn't until we got up above 50% that we had any regeneration in serotonous stands. And even that, it was quite a bit less than what they saw in Yellowstone. Okay, Gloria. So there was a, there was a, a kind of a, a, an important study for us in Colorado that was done early on in the beetle outbreak by uh, Monique Rocca, Bill Rami, student uh, Carissa Aoki at CSU, and they looked at, a, at some stands in Rocky Mountain National Park the first couple of years following um, the beetle outbreak, and they, they concluded that, um, that there probably wouldn't be much of a concern following the beetle outbreak in terms of the amount of seed availability. So the figure shows that there was a decline in germination rate with seed age, and, and as, you, as, as you may know, the cones along the, uh, along the branches are older as you go farther back. They saw some decline, which makes sense. The older cones had, had uh, lower germination rates, but they also had uh, fairly high levels overall. And so they figured that if a fire came through in those conditions, that there would be plenty of seeds to, to, to regenerate those stands. Okay, Gloria. So in 2020, we sort of revisited that because those the, the earlier study those trees had only been dead for a little while in 2020 many of those beetle beetle killed stands have been dead for 15 years um, so they went from dead to deader than a doornail these were these were areas where where things had been standing dead cones have been falling on the ground for for quite a while before they burned and and so our question was quite simple is has there been a change and is serotony declining we looked at four of the, the big fires from 2020 um, and, and sampled unburned stands surrounding them, looked at serotonous cones and, and, and looked at the ages of, of cones as they attached to branches and then did, did germination tests on those. Um, go ahead, Gloria. Our, our findings are pretty simple. And, 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 and the, one of the main, the, the um, our, our findings are simple and some of them are, are, are similar. Are, are simple, simple, similar. Is that me? Or I'm I, um, so the, 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 uh, we, we found that across our eight stands, um, we, we saw the determination rate with with cone age, which makes sense. That's what we saw. That was what was seen in the earlier study. Um, but but in general, the, uh, the germination rates were quite a bit lower than what was seen in those earlier studies. So they were looking at things between 70% and a little bit lower. We started out at about 40% and across the age of our, our cone age dropped down to about 20%. So that, that means that we were getting uh, only two to three um, seeds coming out of each cone, which is fairly low. Um, similarly, um, there were a lot of cones, especially in the older classes that didn't have any seeds in them at all. Um, and so we had in, in over 35% of the cones, we had no seeds whatsoever. So the long, the, the take home of, of this, this uh, part of the study is that we really saw um, much lower, like a, a third to a half the, the, the germination rates of the earlier studies. Okay, Gloria. So the, the, the question then becomes whether or not that matters. As I said before, lodgepole often regenerates more than enough. Maybe less lodgepole will make the world a better place. Um, 
how, how do we sort of look in terms of, of what, what our expectations are? So if we do a little bit of the back of the envelope calculation, starting with about three seeds per cone, looking at a few hundred trees or cones per tree, and then looking at uh, the numbers of trees per, per hectare, um, we might be with with those rates, we might be around a million seeds or a half a million seeds per hectare or half a million seeds per per acre, which sounds like a lot. Um, if we're if we're only trying to reach a stocking level, a forest service stocking level of 150 trees per acre or 370 per hectare, that might not be too hard. Um, if if we're trying to get back to what the original stand composition was, which would have been about a thousand trees per hectare, we, we might actually need quite a quite a few more seeds. One of the things that's important to realize is that it takes many seeds to get one tree. And so earlier studies, that's what I'm summarizing at the lower part, earlier studies have looked across different types of stand conditions and found that um, that you need you know, thousands of seeds on, on moderate and up to 15,000 seeds for, to produce one tree on a, on a tough site, which might be what we're talking about in the middle of um, high stress climate conditions in, in burned areas um, with predation and, and potentially competition. So we may actually be looking for um, millions, five to 16 million seeds that we would need. Um, and the, um, so basically the numbers that we're producing are 30 to 10 to 30% of what's needed. So bottom line, we may fall far short of what we might need in some areas. Okay, Gloria. One thing I wanted to sort of step back because those estimates sound dire. And in fact, I think that, that what we're presenting is a little bit conservative even. And, and part of it is because of the way uh, of the condition of the cones that we found on the trees. So Forestry 101 teaches if you, if you heat serotonous cones, they open and everything's happy and the seeds fall out. Well, we tried that and, and actually with our, with our beetle killed trees, we had, a, we had a terrible time getting them to open. And we heated them by the variety of, of methods that have been used in the literature at 60 degrees. We tried them at 100. We tried them for various amounts of time. And, and the cones were, were virtually fossilized. You can see in the figure down below one sort of explanation, visual explanation, even heating them for 24 hours, they, they didn't budge at all. And it's because they were so dry. Um, and it wasn't until that we actually soaked the seeds, which is soaked the cones, which is a technique that's been used um, in the literature. Once we soaked the cones overnight, then we started to get them to be able to open up. And that's how we ended up getting our numbers. And so I mean, our, our rates are conservative because we had to sort of go through this, this additional step, which may not be the exact same conditions that occur in a stand when it burns. In other words, it's not likely that those the cones in the in the canopy seed bank are going to get wet before they burn up. Um, we did a, a, a side study looking at the soil seed bank, and and we actually buried cones in there, and we found very similar results to what we did with our soaked cones. So that is provides a bit of a positive news, which is that um, the, the 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 moisture within the soil seed bank is enough to to facilitate the opening of those cones. And we had very good germination or we had similar germination rates in those cones. Okay, go ahead, Gloria. So for, for a bit of context, I just wanted to finish with, with what, are, what we're seeing on the ground. So I painted this kind of dire um, condition. And, and now that we've had the 2020 fires, we've had a couple of years, we've, we've, we've had some opportunities to go out and see, see the, the reality on the ground. Um, we were um, fortunate enough to, to be involved in a project that was um, instigated by people at the, on the Medbow Route National Forest and at the regional office that did a, a very quick kind of GIS exercise to determine what level of, of planting they might need to consider on burned areas. And they actually looked at the worst of the worst. So, so the, the map of the Mullen fire there on the, on the right, those red areas were areas that had over 75% mortality. They were also separated from um, a, a live seed, uh, um, seed wall. 
um, and they were part of their administrative harvest areas and so on. We've done this work on both the Mullen and the East Troublesome fire. Um, we focus on Lodgepole because that's what most of these stands are. About 90% of that fire was in Lodgepole. Um, and we also um, looked at, at various stand ages. The, 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 the map on the lower left, the, the crazy purple dots on that, those are all our historic clear cuts within on the footprint of the Mullen fire. And, and as you can see, there, there, there's a lot of different ages uh, or a lot of different old, old clear cuts on there. Um, and and you know, about 40% of that area was actually harvested. So we wanted to look at that as well as, as, we're, as we did the study. Okay, go ahead, Gloria. And I just wanted to show you just a tiny bit of data to, to kind of give you an idea of where this project is, is going to be going. We, we divided things up to look at recent clear cuts um, um, younger regenerating stands and up to old growth forest or or uncut forest. And the bottom line, I know there's a lot of there lot on here. The only thing I wanted to point out is that when we looked at a number of stands, we looked at 12 different different stands with multiple plots and, and belt transects within them. The worst conditions, as probably would be expected, were in the recent clear cuts. Um, the the older forests maybe were not quite so bad. But if you think about things the way the Forest Service does, which is whether or not a stand is stocked and whether or not they may need to plant it, none of these 48 sites were stocked. They all fell below what they what the U.S. Forest Service requires, which is 70% of stands of, of plots within a stand have trees in them. So this is a kind of a and what we went out to do was was evaluate the worst of the worst. And I think our responses is, is that the worst of the worst is pretty bad. And that's what this is this is showing us. Um, go ahead, Gloria. I think that's one. I think I got one more here. Um, yeah, the the, the we've we're, we've we're, we're looking at a lot of stand attributes and trying to figure out what might explain some of our responses. We've found fairly low levels of cone. Um, of, 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 of cone survival in or open cones in these burned areas, which um, part of that is because of the, 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 the severity of the fires. Um, part of that may be that, that in the older beetle killed stands, the cones have already fallen off the trees. And earlier studies have looked at the fact that, that within the first few years, you can lose over half of the, the beetle kill cones. And so that cohort may already be on the ground. And so some of the cone condition is going to help us to explain some of our findings. Okay, I've got my conclusion slide and then I'm done. Okay, so I, it's hard to know whether it's, it's already time to start singing the blues for, for Pinus contorta um, or whether this is just a more variability in, um, in lodgepole pine. Um, but what, what I think we can, we can say is that things are not going to be the way they were before. Um, the Serotony resilience um, connection may not be as strong. We've got a, a half to a third of the, of the seeds coming in from, from a large percentage of the trees that are in these stands compared to what we would have in the past. And it's important to keep in mind that some of these stands might have 90% beetle kill in them, but they still have green trees. And that's kind of a key kind of ray of hope um, both the seed bank information I showed you, and then also the the whatever live cones are on or, or cones were on the live trees, those may be enough to to restock the stand. So that's something that we've got to keep in mind. Um, we need to pay special attention to these recent harvest areas, and often that's not really considered what those earlier stand conditions are. And I think when we when we we're thinking about where to revegetate or where we might have problems, we need to look at those past harvest systems. Um, we will be following this work up with more sampling next summer um, in those fires. And then in some of the earlier fires I mentioned before, we're gonna be doing some additional seed viability work across some of these areas. And then this work ties in with some planting work we're doing at, with lodgepole pine in watershed um, restoration project we have on the Williams Fork, and then um, and then and then other work that we we hope to get involved in moving forward. So with that, thank you, Gloria, very much, and I appreciate your special technical assistance and everybody else for your attention. And I cede the floor.
direct and um, practical and succinct. Oh, wait, I have to stop share. Okay, succinct um, um, summary saying. of your research. Um, everyone, we are, if you're joining, if you're joining us a little late, um, speakers, please introduce yourselves as we transition. We'll now have Laura Marshall um, talking about early, well, no, we're supposed to have Marin. Correct, Marin is next, talking about natural forest regeneration post-fire. Sorry about that, Laura. Um, and please enter your questions and comments in chat and I'll be facilitating that. Um, and we'll have uh, open up the floor for question and answer uh, from two o'clock to 2.30. Uh, so Laura, please introduce yourself and um, give everybody an idea of your research. Thank you very much. And please Can be sure to mute yourself. Okay. Yep. Great. Cool. Um, my name is Marin Chambers. I'm a research associate at the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute here at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. And um, thank you so much to Gloria for the invitation to present some of the work that myself and some of my colleagues, including Kevin Barrett and Camille Stevens Ruman, and a wonderful graduate student here at CSU, Kate Weimer have been implementing um, following the 2020 Colorado wildfires. Um, so we were really trying to understand some of the short and long-term understory plant community and natural forest recovery dynamics in four of the 2020 um, wildfires. And so we looked at um, some of the same fires that Chuck just discussed, the Mullen fire, the Cameron Peak fire, the East Troublesome fire, and the Calwood fires. And you can see our plots are denoted by these um, purple dots or blue stars. We established nearly 120 plots um, across these four fires. Um, and we, within these fires, we tried to equally establish the same number of plots within both high severity burn areas, as well as low to moderate severity burn areas to try to understand the differences um, in understory vegetation and um, tree um, establishment dynamics that we were seeing. And so we're defining um, high severity as 100% overstory mortality within an area of, I, I believe, at least 200 meters from surviving forest. Um, and then our low to moderate severity burn areas are um, anything that was less than 90% um, overstory mortality. We defined this initially by utilizing the um, available soil burn severity layers in 2021 and then um, a, a uh, additional field assessment once we were in the field. And so we started monitoring um, uh, in 2021 and finished up our two-year post-fire monitoring in 2022. Um, so we sampled all of the forest vegetation types that were burned um, in these wildfires and lumped them based upon land fire data that was available. So um, that included the general forest vegetation type, the ponderosa pine, mixed conifer, um, and we lumped dry and mesic mixed conifer for reasons of capacity, um, and then uh, lodgepole and spruce fir forest types. And then within these, fire, these um, plots, we were sampling, generally speaking, tree germination, understory vegetation recovery, and fuels dynamics. And the data that I'm gonna be presenting is preliminary data. Um, we just finished cleaning up this data. Um, and I do wanna mention that we were unable to sample um, our mixed conifer sites, unfortunately, in our second year um, due to capacity constraints, but plan to do so in 2023. So, um, so I'm gonna present um, this data in just a couple of different ways for you in brief. Um, so I wanna do this by each fire and then um, illustrate for you the, the germination that we were seeing per acre, which is on the X axis. Um, I'm sorry, the, yeah. Um, and then um, on the Y axis, excuse me. And then the um, forest types that we studied on the X axis. And then we're splitting this up on the left-hand side of each figure by our high severity burn areas. And on the right side of the figure is our low to moderate severity burn areas. And then on the top portion of the figure is um, the germination that we saw in 2021 versus in 2022 on the bottom. So for the Calwood fire, um, 
we saw that um, our high severity burn plots in 2021 saw no germination, um, but that in um, our low to moderate severity burn plots in the Calwood fire um, in Ponderosa Pine um, systems, which is the only system we were able to sample, um, that we saw about 400 germinates per acre. Um, is that me speaking in the background? I don't know if that if there's someone else in the background that had a question. Yes, everyone, please, please be sure upon entering, we've had some uh, people joining us late, please be sure you are muted upon entering. You're welcome to keep your um, video two-dimensional image up, but please be sure you're muted. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria. Um, and then in, so in um, 2021, our, high, our low to moderate severity burn plots, we saw about 400 germinates per acre of Ponderosa. And then in 2022, we saw those germinates decline by about half in our low to moderate severity burn areas. Um, and then in 2022, in our high severity burn areas, um, we saw Ponderosa pine um, germinating in the high severity burn areas, as well as a little bit of Douglas fir but at relatively low levels. Um, in the Cameron Peak fire, um, we were able to sample all of the forest vegetation types that burned in, in that fire. Um, and because that fire is so large, it burned everything from lower elevation ponderosa pine all the way up to um, our spruce fir forest type. Um, and so in 2021, in our high severity burn areas, um, in our ponderosa pine dominated forests, we saw very, very little ponderosa pine regeneration. In our mixed conifer forest type in 2021, we did see um, very small amounts of uh, lodgepole, ponderosa pine, and aspen regeneration. And, um, the, and then um, in lodgepole pine, we saw a fairly large amount of um, regeneration of lodgepole. And so I'm gonna kind of walk us through all of these figures because a lot of these other germination rates are so small, they hardly show up in a graph like this because of, because of these lodgepole rates. Um, so I'll walk you through that, but essentially kind of going back to Chuck's um, statements earlier, what we saw in 2021 in um, lodgepole for regeneration was about 3,200, um, I'm sorry, 32,000 germinates per acre, um, which as Chuck mentioned, you know, may not be an, you know, a sufficient amount of germination, um, at least for that first year, if we were to just have that as a snapshot of time. Um, and then in our spruce fir forest, um, we saw only a small amount of blue spruce re um, germinating in our high severity burn areas. Um, and then in 2022, in our high severity burn areas, um, again, we saw about the same amount of germination for ponderosa pine. Um, we were unable to sample those mixed conifer plots, unfortunately. Um, but we did see a decline in lodgepole pine in those, those pre-fire lodgepole pine stands. Um, and that was um, just, just a slight amount, which is probably representing just natural desiccation of some of those, um, those germinants. And then we also saw um, some addition of uh, aspen germination um, or sprouting. And then in the spruce fir um, systems in our high severity burn area in the Cameron Peak Fire, we saw um, a very small amount of subalpine fir um, germination and then also a, sub, a small amount of um, germination that we were unable to identify. Um, and then in our low to moderate severity burn plots um, in the Cameron Peak fire, um, we saw very little um, ponderosa pine regeneration in, the, in that forest type. Um, in our mixed conifer forest type, we again saw very little amounts of um, ponderosa, lodgepole, and Douglas fir germination um, in our Low to moderate sites um, in Lodgepole, we uh, saw about 8,000 germinants per acre. Um, and so it was so dramatically less than in the high severity burn areas. And then in our spruce fir, we saw small amounts um, of germination of um, uh, subalpine fir and Engelman spruce. And those um, trends essentially repeated in 2022. Um, maybe the only thing to really note is that in 2022, the Engelman spruce that we saw in our spruce fir forest type um, had disappeared. So all of those germinants had um, desiccated. 
In the East Troublesome Fire, we were only able to sample the spruce fir forest type due to some constraints I'll discuss in just a moment. Um, but we did, we did note um, very clearly that our high severity burn plots um, had absolutely no um, germination in both 2021 and 2022. Um, however, our low to moderate severity burn pl uh, plots we saw about 1,300 um, germinants per acre in 2021 of subalpine fir, which declined to um, less than half of that in 2022. Um, similarly, our um, Engelman spruce germination was present in both 2021 and 2022, but it declined by over half in 2022 from those um, 2021 values. And then again, we saw uh, blue spruce in um, 2021 germinating, uh, but none of those um, germinants were recorded in 2022. And then we did see a small but consistent amount of lodgepole in the low to moderate severity burn plots in the subalpine um, fir plots that we had in the East Troublesome Fire. And then for the Mullen Fire, um, we were only able to sample um, lodgepole pine and spruce fir. Um, uh, forest types since that was the dominant forest types in that fire. Um, and in our high severity burn areas, we saw a large flush of um, lodgepole pine, um, relatively speaking in relationship to all the other species, um, but still kind of coming in at under about 2000 germinants per acre. Um, and that was in 2021. And those values declined again in 2022. We also saw um, uh, aspen sprouting, and that increased in um, 2022 as well. And then in our spruce fir forest, um, forests in the Mullen Fire in high severity burn areas, we saw that um, we had a presence, um, but very, very negligible of both Engelman spruce and lodgepole pine. Um, and while we saw a slight increase in that, in um, subalpine fir in 2022, we saw a decrease in lodgepole pine, um, as well as the, um, the presence of um, a little tiny bit of Engelman spruce and aspen. Um, and then in our low to moderate severity burn areas um, in the Mullen fire, um, in lodgepole pine, we saw small amounts of um, Engelman spruce and um, subalpine fir germinating um, with a larger amount of um, lodgepole germination, and then um, a very small amount of blue spruce. And then in 2022, we lost some of that um, subalpine fir and Engelman spruce. We had a uh, pretty big increase in um, lodgepole pine and a slight increase in blue spruce. Um, and then in our subalpine forests um, in the plots in, those, um, in that area, we saw relatively consistent germination um, at lower levels of subalpine fir between 2021 and 22. And then in 2022, we saw um, a very small amount of Engelman spruce germination. So um, I think that, you know, it's interesting to note the general kind of averages of germinants that we were seeing. But one thing I do wanna note is that because of constraints relating to um, access to uh, public land, um, road access, safety related issues for our crews, and then just general crew capacity. We were only able to sample certain areas of these relatively large fires. And I think this is particularly notable in the East Troublesome Fire. When we were starting to actually establish plots in 2021, um, and excuse me, there's a very loud uh, um, uh, noise going on behind me, my apologies. Um, but when we were starting to establish plots in 2021, um, these areas were um, mostly cut off to us because Highway 125 um, had some pretty significant flooding and erosion events. So we were somewhat limited in um, accessing that fire. Um, but I think one of the things I really wanna illustrate for you all is where we were seeing um, absolutely no germination um, instead of just those germination averages. Um, and so, I just wanna highlight some of the kind of interesting findings that have come out of our preliminary analyses. And that is primarily that in our low to moderate severity burn plots in Ponderosa pine dominated forests, we generally saw a decline in the presence um, of, of um, Ponderosa germination in our plots between 2021 and 2022. And I think this is very likely just indicative of natural desiccation um, 
Chuck uh, very nicely referred to this, that it takes lots and lots of seedlings to actually establish a single tree. But what we were seeing across the landscape that we sampled was a reduction in plots um, that had germination. Um, and then in um, lodgepole pine, um, in the Cameron Peak and Mullen fires, um, by 2022, all of our plots had at least some level of conifer um, uh, germination. Um, and then in our spruce fir um, plots, um, additionally, we saw that in our low to moderate severity burn areas in the Cameron Peak fire by 2020, all of our plots had at least some level of germination. Um, but in the Mullen fire consistently, we saw that 20% of our plots had no germination in either 2021 or 2022. Um, and then finally, and I'll kind of close it up here, um, I think that this is really maybe the most important piece um, that uh, of findings that I find the most interesting is that in some of our higher severity burn plots um, really saw less conifer generate, um, germination, particularly in Ponderosa and our spruce fir forests. Um, and so in the Calwood fire in our high severity burn areas, um, we still saw 50% of our plots that had no you know, germination at all. And this may just be um, indicative of the fact that ponderosa pine um, has episodic masting years. And um, you know, I don't think that um, I've heard that there was a really great masting year in 2021 or 22 necessarily. Um, and so I, you know, this is probably just natural, but it is interesting to note that uh, um, a good portion of our plots did not see any germination at all. Um, and then similarly in the Cameron Peak Fire, 83% um, of our plots in 2021 had no germination. We added an additional five plots um, to our sample size in 2022. Um, and then we did see that only 36% of our plots had no um, germination. So there was definitely an increase in germination um, in the Cameron Peak Fire and Ponderosa Pine high severity burn plots. And then in the East Troublesome Fire, as I previously mentioned, in the spruce fir forest type and high severity burn areas, we saw absolutely no germination um, in those plots. Um, and then in the Mullen Fire, in our subalpine plots um, in high severity burn areas, we saw that again, over two thirds of our plots um, also had no germination. Um, and so, you know, I think that this is, um, sort of speaking to what we understand about subalpine forests in particular, that they take a long time to recover. Um, and so this could just be in different difference of that, um, you know, indicative of that difference between um, spruce fir forest type and other forest types of how long they take to actually recover. But this may actually be indicative that these areas might be a good candidate for planting and certainly for further monitoring to understand um, longer term recovery in these areas. So our next step for these sites um, is to do a full data set and analysis um, um, and then reporting, including lots of other um, biophysical and topographic variables. Um, and then to share these results specifically with any managers, particularly those on the Arapaho Roosevelt, Pawnee and Medicine Bow National Forest um, who are doing um, post-fire related activities that this um, information may be useful for. Um, we also continue to um, hope to monitor these um, three years, five years, 10 years, and, and you know, possibly longer to understand longer term recovery dynamics in these fires. And then um, personally, I would love to add some additional plots into the East Troublesome Fire, given some of our findings based on um, available capacity and funding. Um, so with that, that is all I have with the exception of there are lots of people to thank for this work. And I really wanna give a great shout out to our field crew who spent a lot of time in these really um, fascinating areas. So thank you, Gloria, and thank you all for your um, attention to this. And I will stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Marin. thanks so much. That gives us a good perspective on what's happening across these landscapes. Um, very interesting results and interested to see what will happen in 2023. Um, we have had a few uh, join us a little late. Um, when you come in, it looks like everybody is muted and uh, you're welcome to leave your video on. If you are interested in continuing education credits, I apologize, I don't have that set right up right now. 
but please email me or post it in chat and we can provide proof of your attendance to receive continuing education credits um, later on. Um, we now have Laura Marshall and we'll fill us in on site and microsite factors on tree seedlings planted. Thank you, Gloria. I'm Laura Marshall. I'm a postdoc at Colorado State University working on a post-fire seedling planting with Paula Fornwald at RMRS, uh, Camille stevens roman at CSU, and a number of other uh, colleagues, some of which are also speaking today. Um, and today I'm going to step back and take a slightly wider view um, looking at some planting results from the Cold Springs fire, which happened a few years before 2020, but has some good implications that we'll want moving forward uh, as we look at addressing restoration needs in the 2020 fires. Of course, a big problem in western montane forests is our legacy of fire exclusion, leading to a much denser forest across many millions of acres, especially ponderosa pine and montane forest systems in the west. Add on to that extreme weather, largely driven by climate change, uh, leads to extreme fire, larger, more severe fire, and really landscape scale change with large areas where you see loss of all tree cover. Um, in Colorado in the Front Range, uh, one of the big risks is these large areas where we just see extirpation of the overstory with conifer species. Um, I'm mostly working on species that are not serotonous so not lodgepole, and without these surviving old seed trees, you're not going to have regeneration um, when you lose all, you know, large trees from, as a result of fire. Uh, and you address this uh, through planting, basically, is our, our main option for post-fire management. Um, with this increase in extreme fire behavior, fire size, patch size, uh, you're just really adding to an already existing backlog of planting that's needing uh, attention in Colorado and around the West. Um, on the right is just a figure uh, from a recent paper with some, some of the folks on the talk, uh, call today, um, looking at areas in recent fires in Colorado where we have this problem of large patches without trees uh, where planting can be needed. There have been steps uh, moving forward to address this planting need, notably the replant at Act from 2021 um, is increasing our ability and pace of planting, um, but going forward, this is a, a major issue. And of course, also, we need to know whether we are successfully using our resources in planting. So you need some level of monitoring on these units. Of course, for planting for restoration, it can be a very important tool to nudge that trajectory of post fire landscapes towards desired conditions. In this case, anything with trees. Uh, this photo specifically is from some work I've been doing in the Hayman, uh, where they have very large areas that are just completely lacking in trees uh, without planting. And that means your seed source is very limited. Uh, just so for a little background on planting, how this goes is seed is collected generally from the forest in the area that the planting uh, action will be taken. Um, that seed is grown out in a couple of major nurseries for Colorado. Mostly it's done at Bessie over in Nebraska. Um, typically what they're planting around here is year or year plus old seedlings. Uh, that are transported in refrigerated trucks in the spring to the planting sites, and they're planting out according to whatever specifications the project calls for, um, either by professional planting crews or sometimes volunteers or a mix, depending on the specific um, project. Uh, there may also be site prep involved, sometimes cutting of down wood, sometimes scalping sites to remove competing vegetation. And generally at the end of planting, uh, stake rows will be set up, which are basically monitoring plots, allowing you to track seedling survival through time at these planting locations and determine whether your efforts are reaching your um, expectations and obligations. In specifically today, we're looking at data from the Cold Springs fire, uh, which happened in July 2016 near Netherland, Colorado, really practically in town. It was uh, oh, about 500 acres in upper montane forest. So this fire itself uh, had a lot of moderate to high severity, so a lot of tree loss within those uh, colored patches on the map. Um, and our planting unit is in the lower right within that black line, uh, which is essentially the intersection of the Arapaho Forest 
uh, service land and the fire boundary. Uh, there's a lot of private land in this area and eight homes were lost in the fire. So um, there was really a concern in planting here to both well, ensure that these areas recover, uh, but also to specifically uh, look at the species that are coming in. Um, which in this case they addressed by planting multiple species. Um, specifically Ponderosa, Limber Pine, and Douglas fir. So those are three seed obligate species that aren't likely to come back once you get in, you know, more than hundred or so meters past surviving tree line. These were all species present on the site before fire were in upper montane forest in Colorado. Um, additionally, there is lodgepole on the site. Um, you may, if you have sharp eyes, you may see some dead, uh, some cones and some of those dead lodgepole. And we did see plentiful natural regeneration of lodgepole across this whole planting area. But the only uh, Ponderosa, Limber, and Douglas fir that we found were pretty much planted. Um, in this case, the site was planted out mostly by volunteers. Um, and notably and usefully for this research, there were many stake rows placed. 300 trees were staked across this area, um, 100 of each species, uh, which gives us a wide variety of conditions to look at survival and growth on. Specifically, we're considering a number of factors that contribute to seedling survival and growth. Um, we're looking at aspect, um, north or south facing generally, and then whether the uh, microsite will affect survival. So that's more factors that affect or that are uh, affected by specific seedling placement, things that you can change on the day, uh, while overall site factors are more things that you lay out when planning your planting unit earlier on. Um, specifically for microsite, we're considering shade, uh, whether the seedling is uh, next to a shade object like a log or a stump, and that's specifically something that will provide shade to the roots of the seedling through the afternoon. We also looked at whether the seedlings were sited in a depression, um, which we just generally categorized as wood water collect up the seedling. Um, if, if you like poured your water bottle out on it, say. Uh, and that's, uh, that's kind of a coarse measure, um, but we had some, some relatively significant results from it. Uh, for our response factors, of course, we're looking at survival, uh, total ceiling height, and the growth in 2021 at a period four growing seasons after planting. Um, so our field work was done in summer and fall of 2021, um, where we collected information at all seedlings that were staked um, or stake row points. Uh, of course, um, when you have seedlings die, they're so small, they'll just dry up and blow away. Uh, and with nothing left behind. So you really need a stake there to say whether, say something about broader survival across the unit. Um, we additionally had uh, survival data, data for first and third year from the Rappahannock National Forest. Um, and we sampled, uh, well, Chuck sampled um, soil moisture at the Ponderosa seedlings over that summer as well to look at a possible mechanism driving differences in microsite survival. So for overall survival across these three species that were planted, it was in the 60s by the time we showed up in year four uh, for sampling. Um, with um, It's a fairly, fairly typical number really for planting in Colorado. Uh, and obviously we'd like it to be higher, which is part of why we looked at this data to try and maximize later uh, planting efforts. So we used a generalized linear mixed model to look at significant factors. I'm not going to go into that into too in depth. We can we'll have time for that in questions. Um, but here are our general results for survival, where we found aspect, shade, object presence, and depression presence at the ceiling all to be important to ceiling survival. We had greater survival on north aspects in shade and with a depression across all species. And notably, there were no species interactions seen here. Um, well, for height, uh, we found aspect, north aspect, and shade presence to be significant along with species. Um, and here, the likely, the different species were likely at different heights when they were planted. So you'd expect, you know, a continuing difference in height um, as, as they grow. 
height growth. So the growth in 2021 uh, followed similar patterns where as north aspect and shade presence were important for survival or to height growth. Um, and again, species was also important. And here we also had interaction between aspect and shade uh, being important for the height growth. So that may reflect um, different species growth habit considerations along with um, I just re relative uh, uh, relative ability to tolerate the conditions. Okay, for soil moisture, um, we did find that depression was significant for soil moisture, uh, though the effect was not very large. Um, here we were just sampling uh, basically percent soil uh, water content at ponderosa ceilings on two days in that summer period. Um, it was a relatively dry summer and that we were sampling fairly far out from precipitation events. So um, if we had done more samplings or sampled closer to a rain event, we might have had greater differences across the site, but um, it was at least encouraging to see the, that a difference showed up for a depression presence, because that does give us a, a hint at some kind of mechanism actually driving the effects seen for survival. So to sum up, we generally found greater survival on north aspects with shade with depression. Uh, greater heightened growth were seen on north aspects and shade and there were species interactions there. Um, interestingly, though, we don't have a large enough uh, sample size to you know, really you know, elevate this into the paper. Um, I'll just note that for the small number of seedlings that had kind of the best conditions, so on a north aspect in the shade with a depression, we had 90% survival, while the converse of that and the kind of worst conditions, we saw 31%. So that's, that's a, a small number overall of seedlings, so the project wasn't really designed to look at that specifically, but it really is um, compelling for later work potentially, uh, or if you really want to maximize um, what, what you're getting from planting, uh, by it's probably best to really focus in on planting into those more mesic sites and microsites on north and north aspects with shade and potentially with depressions. Um, it would also be interesting to look at this in the future in term, cl more closely in terms of species. Um, here, uh, we think traits might be important. Uh, notably, Douglas fir is a, really, a much more moisture sensitive species than the other two planted. Um, An aspect really had a really substantial effect on Douglas fir survival compared to the pines. So there may might be something there to look at further as well. Um, so our history of fire exclusion and climate change are really causing problems in some of these frequent fire montane forests. 2020 is really adding to a currently existing backlog of areas needing planting to maintain uh, your desired forest conditions, maintain that forest stand, um, and really as, as we've seen in the past in lots of uh, research into natural regeneration and to planting, um, microsite and site planting choices are really critical for seedling survival and for really maximizing um, the uh, you know, resources used in planting because it is fairly substantial. Um, and obviously we can still know more. Um, and really the goal of all this is to just give planted seedlings just the best shot at survival as we can. And I'll end there. Great. Thank you, Laura. That was really interesting results and you're getting some very interesting questions in chat. Um, <clears throat> we are running behind a little bit. <laughs> uh, we haven't started Kyle Rodman's presentation yet, but I think uh, we have some flexibility at the end of our presentations. Um, so our discussion, we'll have some time for discussion still uh, with some flexibility for our end time. So you're all welcome to stay on to your ability. Uh, and I am going to um, launch Kyle. Kyle, can you introduce yourself and your title affiliation? And we'll get started. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Gloria. This is, uh, this is a fun group to be a part of. Lots of good research happening in these fires in particular. I, I think people are basically trying to figure out how to keep from bumping shoulders and elbows. There's so many scientists in these places. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see if this works. Right. Can you see that okay, Gloria? Okay, cool. 
So yeah, thank you everybody for joining today. It looks like we still have almost 180 people on this call, which is really exciting that so many folks are interested in, in this research and the topic. Um, my name is Kyle Rodman. I'm a research scientist at the Ecological Restoration Institute in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, ERI is a part of the Southwest Ecological Restoration Institutes, of which there are three listed here in the bottom right. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about a report that a couple of these groups have put together um, and this is this is a great list of collaborators here at the bottom. All of the other presenters in this um, this webinar are part of this report, as are several other folks, mostly in Colorado. So some of the motivation for this report that we've been putting together: um, over 10 million acres burned across the U.S. in 2020. It's the second largest fire year on record in the U.S. since the early 80s, during the start of good record keeping. Um, and this is data from the national, uh, the NIFC. So this figure on the right showing that where you see this general increase in area burned across the US with 2020 being a particularly dramatic example. Um, and when we're talking about this region in particular in Northern Colorado and Southern Wyoming, several of the largest fire years, uh, fires on record occurred in 2020. So that's part of the motivation Interestingly, though, a huge amount of, of this area burned, particularly in these large fires, occurred in subalpine systems, which are really those kind of upper half of the forests in this region, those upper elevation forests. And these systems are, are um, areas that we don't have as much recent experience in the Southern Rockies with post-fire landscapes that are subalpine. So we've had a few large fires in like the San Juans, for example, in southwestern Colorado. Um, a little bit of subalpine area burned in northern New Mexico, but by and large, a lot of the large fires we've had over the past 40 years or so in this region have been in lower elevation montane forests, and the dynamics are just a little bit different, um, as is the management context. So we were really interested in trying to summarize information about these landscapes to try to help folks make decisions on the ground. So the overall goal of this report, we looked at five large recent fires. Those are shown on the map to the right here. Um, what's interesting about these five fires in particular, I mentioned a huge amount of subalpine area burned, um, but in terms of the total elevational range, these fires range from about 5,000 to 12,000 feet, a huge variety of forest types, climatic conditions. Um, and those are, those are really important because they tell us that these will probably require a, a wide range of management approaches post-fire. Um, they also span a huge number of land designations. Um, so we can phone in specifically on forest service land or park service land, but really all of these different agencies and management designations will have really different approaches to management. Um, huge amount of private land in here as well. So what we were trying to do here is use broad scale spatial data and information from over 10,000 field plots across recent fires in the Western US and take that information about what we know has happened in other places and try to predict what might happen in these areas over the upcoming decade or so. So the first goal here was simply to map distances to live trees throughout each of these fires. And that sounds like it's a simple thing. It's, it's a little more complicated than just being able to look at imagery and say there's a tree here and there's a tree here. These are big areas, doing things manually is pretty challenging. Um, what we ended up doing is we used newly developed maps of fire severity, as well as pre-fire maps of canopy height derived from spaceborne LIDAR. Um, we combined those two things to be able to say, this is where trees were before the fire. These are the areas that burned at high severity in the fire. And then overlay those two things to say, this is about how far different parts of each fire is to the closest tree. Um, and this is important because as a couple of the other speakers alluded to, post-fire recovery for many of the conifers in these areas is limited by seed dispersal from live trees. Um, the clear exception is lodgepole pine and aspen for the non-conifers in this area. But most of the conifers rely on dispersal from live trees. So this proxy of distance to live trees tells us a lot about what might happen after fire. So I don't have time to go into the information for all five of these fires, but I can, I'm can. i just gonna kind of give some examples here. This is a map of distances to live trees in the Cameron Peak fire. Um, so you can see some of these areas are either unburned or very close to surviving trees and other parts of the fire are quite far. So the map on the left is showing that sort of distribution of distances. The graphs on the right tell us about 
if we look specifically at the high severity areas, which are maybe the greater candidates for planting, um, what is that distribution of distances to live trees? This figure on the bottom right is telling us what proportion of the high severity area is in different bins of distances. And we, we separate out these three categories because these places that are maybe burned at high severity, but are within 300 feet or so of a live tree, those are likely to have greater seed dispersal. Um, there's sort of an intermediate category of 300 to 650 feet. It may or may not have some adequate seed dispersal, but those places beyond 650 feet are likely to have very little seed dispersal. So when we look at all five of these fires at once, roughly 43 to 59% of each fire burned at high severity. So total canopy mortality, as Marianne was talking about in her, in her presentation. Uh, but interestingly, of this high severity area, only about 30% is far from live trees. Um, so this is important because we can look at the total area burned or we can look at the high severity area burned and it feels pretty overwhelming. But when you actually hone in on the, on the area that is most heavily impacted, it's only 30% of that 40 to 60% that we're talking about here. I also wanted to point out uh, lodgepole pine and aspen were present in many of these high severity areas that don't have live trees nearby. Um, and these are species with either serotony or the ability to re-sprout that make them particularly well suited to regenerating following high severity fire. Um, as Chuck mentioned, that's not a guarantee by any means, but that gives us some positive signs that things might go in the right direction eventually. Our second goal here was to, as I mentioned, take a bunch of information from other places that have burned in the last several years and try to use that information to predict what might happen in terms of natural recovery for the dominant conifer species. And so these two figures on the right, these were taken by CFRI field crews. Marin showed a couple of these as well, but I like this example because it shows us just how much change can happen in a single year. Um, the top right photo was taken in 2021. The bottom right was taken in 2022 in the same area. And you can see, notably, there's a lot of lodgepole pine coming in in this particular area, um, which again, lodgepole is one of those species we would expect to come in early after fire if it's going to come in well. So a few maps worth pointing out here. This is an example of the East Troublesome Fire. So for each of these species, these are species specific maps of the probability of natural recruitment or natural recovery. And what we're defining as natural recovery is at least 40 trees per acre within 10 years of fire occurrence. Um, and that's a fairly low bar on some of these forests that were initially quite dense. But it just gives us a sense of what areas are more or less likely to have some natural establishment after the fire. <clears throat> so these species codes, the top left is subalpine fir, the top center is lodgepole pine, top right is Engelmann spruce, bottom left is ponderosa pine, and bottom center is Douglas fir. Um, and these maps are restricted to places that had at least some of that species present before the fire. So you'll notice lots of empty space for ponderosa pine, for example, just because there wasn't much of it in this fire to begin with. Then finally, the bottom right map is showing us where each species was dominant before the fire. So what you can see here, lots of variability within this fire. Lodgepole pine seems to be best suited to recover after this fire in many places, but there's lots of variability as well. Um, and a lot of that is driven by differences in topography and climate across this really large fire that burned a range of elevations and hill slopes. So to kind of wrap this piece up, natural recovery potential varies really widely among fires and tree species. When we look across all five of these fires, lodgepole pine seems like it's likely to do fairly well, at least at low numbers, across about 60% of the total burned area. Um, Engelman spruce, that number is more like 20%. Um, these numbers aren't too surprising because as we talked about before, subalpine forests, those higher elevation forests where lodgepole pine and Engelman spruce are fairly dominant, um, those are the ones that were most heavily affected. So the fact that they're the ones that are coming back well or expected to come back well after these fires, not too surprising. Um, but then we also see that things like ponderosa pine could be expected to do well at high elevations in the Cowwood fire, for example, and some localized areas. So this final goal, once we understand both where live trees are not and where things are likely to recover on their own, um, the next step is to say, if we're going to plant, 
what sites might be most suitable in terms of the climate and topography? How well do the climate and topography match what a species can tolerate within these areas? Um, and this is important because we know that trees can live for a long time. Just because a tree was there, a species was there before the fire, doesn't mean that that place is any longer suitable for that same species. Um, things have changed a lot in 200 years, and some of these places have been dominated by the same species since the early 1800s. That doesn't mean that it's any suitable, it's still suitable for the same communities. So we wanted to ask where are recent climatic and topographic conditions most suitable for each of these species? And how could that contribute to information about planting? So you could read these maps in a very similar way to the last one. This is an example from the Mullen fire. Um, places that are sort of the light green or places that would potentially be most suitable for that species based on recent climate and the existing topography within the fire. Places that are like dark purple would be least suitable. So you can see lots of variability within this fire, both among species and among sites. So what we know is that across these areas, large proportions of these places that might have lower natural recovery, these high severity areas far from seed trees, large proportions of those areas seem like they would be good candidates for planting of lodgepole pine and Engelmann spruce. Um, some of the lower elevation areas could be, it could be useful to consider things like Douglas fir and ponderosa pine, um, but we really have to work with the existing topography and climate of the landscape, and that's what these maps are trying to do here. So to kind of tie all this together, the scale of the 2020 fires really highlights the need for strategic planning and post-fire landscapes. Um, and that's shown with this figure here. This is summarizing the area of high severity wildfire across Forest Service lands in the Southern Rockies and the area of planting activities in Forest Service lands in the Southern Rockies. Um, and these are planting activities restricted to areas that burned. So what you can see is generally we've had a pretty consistent amount of planting over time since the early 80s. High severity wildfire has increased pretty substantially, particularly in 2020. Um, notice the broken axis here. So anytime a line goes above that axis, it means a huge amount of high severity fire. So even with increases in funding from the Replant Act and the infrastructure bill, we still have to be fairly strategic about where we can actually conduct these plantings. We just don't have the capacity that we need in some of these cases. So we're hoping that this information can help guide some of these early activities. And we're doing that, hopefully, by identifying areas with the greatest likelihood of natural recovery and suitability for existing tree species. Um, our goal is that this new information helps with local decision making. But again, this information is really no substitute for local, man no local knowledge and experience of managers and stakeholders. Um, the folks making decisions on the ground really are, are the best suited to make these decisions. We're just hoping to give them some additional information that might be added into sort of a larger decision making framework. So really quickly, I just wanted to mention that a draft of this report is up now. It includes all the maps that I've shown here, as well as many others. We also are making the spatial data available to folks that want to download it and bring it into GIS and use it for planning purposes. I'll drop links to both of these in the chat here in a minute. Um, and we also have an Esri story map about this report coming up online here pretty soon. Quickly, I wanted to acknowledge several folks that helped with document production, data archiving, and website designs. So Hannah Brown, Angela Hollingsworth, and Brooke Simmons were really helpful in those, in those parts of this project. <laughs> and then Mark Cohn, who's a student at CSU, has helped us develop this Esri story map that I mentioned. So that's all I got. Thank you all for the attention and for the interest. Okay, thanks so much. Great synthesis, Kyle. Um, and there's lots of interesting comments and questions. For the sake of recording brevity, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, stop recording. Um, this concludes the presentation portion of Rising from the Ashes webinar. This is being recorded and the recording will be posted on uh, the Southern Rockies Fire Science YouTube channel. Um, if you are desiring continuing education credits, please put your email in chat and uh, we will notify you when the recording is available. Um, all speakers, please enter your emails 
and um, related links in your in the chat. And thank you for attending and we will stay on to continue discussion.